<laughs> you know you're already live. Uh, MDO. I will be the only one. I will be the I will one half, one zero. Oh, my Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the semi final of Malaysia Debate Open. Let's do the joke again. I do have a grand final sentence. Oh! <laughs> On the government side, we have uh, Rafiq's caretakers, and on opposition, we have UT Mara. Please welcome both of the <laughs> Audience, please make sure your phones are off and your computers don't have you. Um, TJ will be keeping time. Without any further ado, the motion is that this House, please, liberal democracy should abandon the use of referenda as a mechanism for significant social change. I welcome the Prime Minister. <laughs> Hello adjudicators, the referendum is an obsolete, archaic, and ineffectual remnant of the days of Athenian direct democracy. We on side government will want to do away with them in the modern day and age. This debate, man, uh, Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen, is not about whether or not referendums can produce good or bad outcomes, because we admit to an extent the referendum sometimes can produce positive outcomes, like Ireland's gay marriage referendum in 2015, or they can produce quite silly results, like Scotland's decision to remain in the United <laughs> Kingdom. Yes, Andy, wrong choice. This debate, this debate is firstly about on which side, with referendums or without, are we more likely to have socially progressive changes, and secondly, whether or not referendums or other mechanisms produce more sustainable progressive changes. We're talking obviously about liberal democracies here, not the United States. Uh, so we're talking about countries like the United Kingdom, France, Germany, New Zealand, places where there's large-scale secular support for things like human rights, like freedoms, uh, and, and civil liberties. What do we support in uh, opposition to referendums? We support obviously the legislative playing a, a part in enacting policies and laws which help social progression. We also support the judiciary playing an active role in a holding things like human rights and basic human dignities, but we also believe, on, 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 in the same breath, that governments should be sensitive towards, you know, like, for example, demonstrations or protests or petitions that people bring up, but what, to give that decision to the hands of people in the form of referendum is something we're not okay with. Okay. So firstly, I want to talk about the context and the characterization of what referendums look like. So a referendum is usually announced with a sort of six-month, one-year grace period, and then the campaigning for and against the vote begins. Now, what is the nature of this campaigning. It is largely assertive and sensationalized. It is very rarely fact-checked by an average reasonable voter, which is where you get like a lot of sensational um, fear-mongering on both sides of the aisle. Uh, remember that the Leave campaign uh, during the, the, the um, uh, European Union referendum for the United Kingdom asserted that the United Kingdom pays over 800 billion pounds a year to the European Union, which was Fact, uh, factually untrue, but these things are largely um, part and parcel of these sorts of referendum campaigning. What does the media highlight, however? We don't think the media picks up on the, fact, the, the facts, on the real-time discourse, on the analysis of experts. The media, on the other hand, chooses to often sensationalize the fear and the paranoia, because people having a good time and living in peace doesn't make for good headlines. Yeah, and what yeah. does make for good headlines are pictures, for example, of uh, pro-life protests which depict Pe uh, 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 abortion as murder, uh, things like, for example, uh, headlines about refugees committing crimes in order to encourage people to vote against um, immigration reform. These are the kinds of things that the media picks up, and this is what uh, uh, affects people's decisions. Now, we're not. Now, is the decision during a referendum really 
representative of people's opinions. We think not. We think yeah, yeah. many people are undecided about a lot of these sorts of social changes. Many average people are just undecided as to whether or not they feel abortion is a moral or immoral thing to do, and that's their opinion. But what oftentimes happens is that referendums, when they do happen, often represent a visceral reaction on the part of the voters <coughs> towards the sort of sensationalizations that are happening in the media. So for example, remember, during the uh, US presidential election, remember that WikiLeaks leaked out uh, the fact that um, Hillary Clinton had been sending out emails, the FBI reports, on the day before the election. Look at how that swayed public opinion against Hillary Clinton, <laughs> making her seem like an untrustworthy candidate. I know it's not about referendums, but this is exactly how media portrayals can sway public opinion uh, in such a small way. So the same thing can happen, for example, during uh, a referendum for abortion. The, you know, like oftentimes the media portrays abortionists as murderers, and this is what sways public opinion. So we don't think it's actually a fair representation of people's views. On the other hand, what about the judiciary and the legislature? We think that the legislative is not necessarily dictated by things like mob rule. We think politicians have a certain sense of security are, and are, are able to take more centrist views and are not necessarily held hostage by public opinion and public sentiment at that point in time. We think on, uh, also that things like the judiciary are more accountable because oftentimes when when politicians or, or judges vote on a certain decision, we know exactly who votes, we know the reasons for why they vote, we know who votes for which side, and we can hold those individuals accountable. We can't hold people accountable during anonymous referendum processes. Other, uh, another reason is that, like the judiciary, for example, oftentimes has to provide things like uh, reasoning and ratio decedendi when they give up these opinions. So when a judge, for example, votes in favor or against gay marriage, they often have to argue those things. These things are also subjected to appeals, which people can undertake. We think that's a lot more of an accountable process compared to a referendum. Yes, Akila. All right, so I can apply this prime minister's speech to, to invalidate voting, right? But we still recognize that voting is a legitimate expression of the people, so we don't understand why it's exclusive voting to know. Absolutely true. I absolutely admit that during election processes, we also talk about things like abortion and gay marriage. But note this, and I'm glad you brought it up, that oftentimes politicians are not single issue politicians, and during elections, you don't have single issue votes. Very rarely do you get somebody who votes for a politician on the very basis that they would legalize or criminalize gay marriage, right? So oftentimes during elections, the discourse is a lot more toned down, it is a lot, yeah. it's, it's more like, it is about a lot more issues, and it's more objective compared to when you have referendums which are really about sensationalizing one side or the other. But lastly, we would say, ladies and gentlemen, that having referendums oftentimes takes away the ability for the public and the, 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 the popular, the, sorry, the, the populace to use other forms of dispute mechanisms. So when you have referendums, available, referendums oftentimes becomes the go-to option when governments need to make tough decisions. Recall how David Cameron offered the Brexit referendum on a platter for the British people, and after they voted to leave, Cameron left the cabinet, so did, so did Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage uh, uh, resigned as leader of UKIP, and this allows governments the plausible deniability to really make good, objective decisions, because oftentimes, in order to stave off that sort of public pressure, governments will give referendums as an option to voters, allowing these voters to make those decisions without really thinking how they're going to implement these mechanisms when the vote comes to pass. So we think in terms of having good decision-making procedures, politicians are more likely to make those decisions. Even in the worst case scenario where you have like conservative parties in government, we still get social change because cons even conservative politicians need to have like uh, political bartering and horse trading with other liberal politicians in parliament. So we have a way to negotiate social change, we have a way to hold social changes accountable, and we have a way to stop mob rule on our side of the house. We're very happy to propose this motion. Okay, we take that speech for that speech. Now we welcome the Leader of Opposition. Thank you. Hello, it's weird. To listen to Rafik's speech talk about what mob rule necessarily is, when it is a democracy, when it is a referendum that the majority has to still vote in favor for, and you require the numbers in order for it to become persuasive and for people to believe in it a little bit more. I'll talk about why the election process is something that's harmful. 
and something that ne never was really defended by Rafiq's speech, in order to tell us why legislation is effectively going to mean more social changes in this current day and age, but it's very hard for you to achieve things such as abortion, for example, when you have Republicans who are in power and are willing to just vote it out because they're in position of power due to gerrymandering or the electoral college that happens within America. Three large brothers made to provide one my speech. Firstly, the problem of referendums are somehow because fact and say since Sensationalization by the media is a thing. Notice how this same exact point can be used for graphic speech to say things such as individuals using like sensationalization in order to sway the vote in favor of Republicans in the last minute. Anyway, Emmanuel Macron's like campaign was the, the day before was the, like they, they released information about what happened with the campaign, and that same applies for an election. It doesn't just have to apply for a referendum. Realize that the, the problem that you have uh, in Rafik's speech was in exact scenarios as to why referendums were bad, but not with the system in and of itself. But secondly, really, it's perfectly legitimate for individuals to vote on the sentiment that you feel the day before. If you think that Hillary Clinton is not someone that you believe believe in because of like a last minute reason, it's still a reason for like is that individual to to be able to fight for your vote. That particular scenario, we think the same happens for referendums. We don't think this point stands exclusively for referendums only. Second thing, whether or not it's accountable, no, thank you, Mike. Firstly, we also like the, the, this one to say we have judges in uh, our current system that are able to give racial decisions. That they see data at the end of the day. Notice that, that referendums also are able to allow judges to utilize when it comes to giving up the racial decisions. That they see data that it comes to the judicial system at the end of the day. It is binding, but even if it's not binding, it's highly persuasive for individuals who believe so. In order to provide that reasoning. No, thank you. But secondly, that is info that you use to, to get from individuals when it comes to elections are probably also the same reasons as to why the media can get away without any accountability when it comes to elections that happened in the last minute. Notice how a lot of people had political assassination before Brexit necessarily happened. Nigel Farage, for example, were good. Uh, well, most of the time, the examples that we can then use. Last thing we just want to talk about. Um, sometimes, uh, the, the last minute of Rafi's speech was about sometimes you make bad decisions because you don't follow through with the referendum that you necessarily want. The the only example that Rafiq wanted to use in his speech was Brexit. We think this is a fault out of circumstance when it comes to the UK, and not really a problem with the system in and of itself. My speech will talk about the system in itself and why the debate is about referendum compared to elections in your particular scenario. We don't think God can run away with this. First thing, no thank you, Mike. First thing, why referendums are able to tap into democratic representation. Secondly, why referendums will be effective as a complement to social issues. Lastly, why you can use it in order to bolster change that can happen on the outside of the house. First thing, how referendums are able to tap, to tap into democratic representation. Let's make a comparison as to what exactly government has. They didn't really tell you what exactly was the alternative. But we can also assume that it's likely to be elections which are long, are doers processes, where it is horribly represented by the way it is in Senate, for example, in America, where they assume that it's easy to just leave it to these individuals or politicians to make the decisions for you without people being able to vote on similar issues that can happen within referendums. No, thank you. Well, what do you mean when it comes to referendums in this bit? That A, it's slightly going to be easier for the individual who is the lowest common denominator to vote because there's less apathy, we feel that there's direct power to change when it comes to single issue voting at the end of the day. Something your trade-off didn't really explain in your speech. But secondly, it's a binary or single issue question that happen whether it is a yes or no, Brexit or not, bad choice or not. But then what happens in this particular scenario is that individuals are able to just say yes or no instead of having to weigh in so many issues that happens within a Republican compared to a Democrat or Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump when it comes to a myriad of issues that you have to weigh as an, individual, as an individual person. The last thing we'll say about when it comes to referendums is that it's independent from politics. And here's the most important part. Because you have to be able to defend a world in which individuals will be able to use so many issues against a single social justice, uh, a single social issue at the end of the day, and say things such as the economy is more important than allowing individuals to gain access to abortion. Therefore, it's more important for us to vote for the economy than it is and utilize social authorities instead of tackling the debate head on. Talk about two more things when it comes to why is it good that we have access. Firstly, we don't think referendums are tied to legal inconveniences. Things such as it takes a very long process for you to register, for example, or individuals who literally feel like the process of voting is too long that they can't handle the change that you're about to see in the short term future. We think that it's more in it's more likely that an individual who wants to vote in this particular scenario because you feel that there's a more proximate choice in front of you that you feel direct power towards. Mm -hmm. But secondly, that also means a low barrier of access. Things such as societal issues are likely to be controversial and affect your level of right when it comes to your life and you feel like you're in power for you to be able to enact that kind of change. But lastly, things such as it's typically a single issue that means, mm -hmm. can exact, that, that means that you can't utilize things such as partisanship when it comes to making the kind of decisions that you want. Examples are things such as a moderate Republican that agrees to welfare 
for the poor individuals who can also reconcile with things such as the free market or things such as being a person who wants to vote for Republican issues, for example, yes. that you support abortion but believe in a limit in limiting the government is possible for an individual because it becomes more single issue at the yes. end of the day. You don't have to compromise a lot of issues. That's why people like Donald Trump can just say abortion, but economy and jobs is more important. Yes. Immigration, but you're taking away jobs from our own people. It won't be the likely scenario that will happen on the outside because we allow referendums but individuals don't need to have your politicians yes. use partisanship as a part of the calculus that you're about to make when it comes to the decision. When you have representation in excess, we feel more people will feel that there's power at hand That's and right. you don't have to rely on economic manifestos for you to make that decision. I'll take the cute one. Uh, Wasting elections, elected politicians are still required to go to the legislative policy making yep. process to yep. check the balances exist. Isn't the result of your referendum far more binding with greater consequences to minorities? Uh, not really, my. So here's talk about whether there will be social justice issues that will be voted on on your side of the house. What do you rely upon? Things such as a Republican, things such as filibusters and legislative, and also people in positions of power when it comes to the Senate that actually won because the well, not majority of people in America actually voted for it because the Electoral College got you into that position of power. A referendum uses numbers and you don't use seats in the power of the house around the vote for the issue. If 51% of individuals in America believe in abortion, then that means that the majority is likely to become in favour of a referendum. If 53 people actually voted for Hillary Clinton, but the 47 won, which are Republicans because Donald Trump, because of the electoral college, they are less likely to get the representation of the majority in that particular scenario. So you have to make sure that this trade-off is something that you're willing to have. Which is less likely that you will have tabled issues because there are going to be Republicans who are conservative who will not even want to table this in legislative parliaments because they are in the position of power to do so and secondly because the lowest common denominator doesn't feel that they have approximate change to come here and say I want to vote yes or no. The reason as to why the Brexit vote made sure that a lot of people wanted to participate in it was that they felt that it could change at the end of the day and become a person who can make sure that your vote counts. Relying on Nigel Farage or David Cameron won't do much. Okay, we take that speaker for the speech. Now we welcome Deputy Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, public opinion is as mercurial as the weather changes throughout the day. The reason for that is because people don't need to be held accountable or do not have to face the minorities that will face the persecution as a result of your legislation. That you will never have to live through the lives or feel the consequences of your decision to flippantly vote no whenever a homosexual asks for the right for gay marriage. That you will never have to experience the consequences of saying no to immigration law in this particular circumstance. There are no incentives to bridge between the livelihoods of the majority and the mob, ladies and gentlemen, as well as the people affected by these policies at the end of the day. That is the bridge that the opposition ignores in this particular circumstance. While in the government bench, we've already made multiple levels of analysis that went unresponded to in the leader of opposition. I think chiefly at the end of Rafik's speech, that we told you that the existence of even referendums as an option make all other legislative or judicial kinds of uh, re dispute resolution systems become less viable, less referred to by politicians or people in power, ladies and gentlemen, because it's a lot more expedient, a lot more convenient to pawn off the responsibility of difficult decisions and negotiating necessary in those very, very difficult issues in order to gain cheap political points, the same way how David Cameron pawned off the decision in order to score cheap political points in order to win one election, and when the result didn't turn out how he wanted, he just quit his job, ladies and gentlemen. That's why 
that incentive by having it even on the table, ladies and gentlemen, diminishes all other options in this particular circumstance. And the reason why it's important for them to respond to this is because Booker doesn't tell us. If it's so great to have a referendum, are you willing to run entirety of government on the basis of referendum in this particular circumstance? Because there isn't any acknowledgement on the opposition bench of the value of having at least some level of representative democracy as opposed to direct mob rule in this particular circumstance. The reason why we've moved on from a Athenian democracy where they have a direct democracy is because we recognize that we need an actor that can mediate right. the interests of the entirety of society, protect minority rights, as well as to ensure that a mob with its material public opinion does not rule in this particular circumstance. Not yet. But secondly, we think that the leader of opposition was exceedingly glib when explained to us why is it that we think that public opinion was mercurial. Because the only response was that, well, those arguments also apply to vo uh, voting as well, without actual analysis as a uh, uh, response to us. Yes, voting and elections is a necessary evil for us to balance between the interests of representative democracy as well as direct democracy in this particular circumstance. We need to have some level of voting in this particular scenario. But the question in this debate is extents, not the existence of one or the other. That means, on your side of the house, you need to respond to all of Rafik's arguments in regards to when you're deciding on a deeply controversial issue like abortion or gay rights, why isn't it true that a person can't just release, for example, as happened in Brexit, release on the day of the Brexit vote a bunch of videos of, for example, ISIS cutting off people's heads or, for example, refugees flooding over the border, ladies and gentlemen, to scare white people in this circumstance in order to vote for leave in this circumstance. Or, in most circumstances, uh, for example, Planned Parenthood, releasing a video of a fetus being dissected and saying that they're experimenting and there are so many abortions happening in, in that context to scare individuals into making a split decision in that situation. The thing that you have to know is that when people make decisions, they make decisions based on emotions, sentiments, as well as the, the visceral feeling and reaction that they have in that particular scenario. I'm not asserting that. It's merely because logically, they never have to be accountable for those decisions. They never have to answer for those decisions. Votes are anonymous. They never have to explain and reason out those decisions to begin with. They never have to confront people that those, con those decisions will have to face at the end of the day. The comparative we provide to you right from the start was that the legislature the judiciary would have all those things as opposed to the public. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we prove it to you analytically why we shouldn't allow more group to be uh, to, to, to uh, drive the decision at the end of the day. But secondly, they have to prove that the discussion surrounding leading up even would be a productive one on this side of the house. Because the kind of information that you get leading up to a referendum was something we talked about, which wouldn't be productive and representative of people's views. That the information that you got were things like that are sensational, things that will trigger fear, not be, merely because the media has absolutely no profit incentive to show things that were kumbaya, nice and lovely between refugees and people. There was a lot more news worthy and headline grabbing in order to paint refugees as people getting angry at them. Or for example, to throw out this scandalous new email that WikiLeaks just dropped on, uh, on, on, on Hillary Clinton. Or to blow out for 48 hours right before the election, James Comey coming out and talking to, to, to the Senate, uh, Senate committee, ladies and gentlemen. All those things are so much more controversial in comparison to a kumbaya nice message that they would have to rely on in order to get all the progress and change on this side of that means, what have we proven so far? That you might have sometimes so social progressive change on this side of us, but we've proven to you through an actual analysis why well, it's a lot more likely for you to have socially regressive decisions because of the fear and systematic systematic misinformation that occurs as a result of referendums. Yes, sir. How is partisanship in, the Amer in America with so many Republican conservatives yep. in the Senate better oh, than right. allowing social change for gay marriage? For okay, people? so he says a very good argument that there are party lines that people are beholden to, but we've given you several levels of analysis. <coughs> First, that even in an instance where you have party lines to vote across, you still have to have political horse trading in order to ensure that your legislative agenda gets through. You can't burn your bridges with the Democratic Party because, like he says, that the Democrats will be able to filibuster your legislation, will be able to obstruct you in Senate committee hearings, will be able to block your appointees, will be able to ensure that you won't be able to get any of your legislation through because some legislations require, for example, 60, 60 votes in the Senate and Republicans, even in your worst case scenario, 
scenario only have 52, 53 seats. So that means that unless you're talking about a super conservative government that has absolute control over the government and does it not require any sort of cooperation by the opposition, in that instance, we think that your population is most likely really conservative and we would rather have people in power be accountable and uh, uh, have to put their decisions down on paper. If not, in any reasonable democracy where it's kind of half and half, you'll, be, you'll need to have political horse trading and hold people accountable. Party lines don't matter so much if you at least can uh, reason out certain things. But the last thing that Mukri says that's really important is that at least I don't need to weigh up many different factors. That's exactly the problem. The white person in Arizona does not need to weigh up the minority rights he's taking away because he only votes in his own interest. The politician has to get the vote for both in this particular circumstance and has to mediate those interests. You have to tell us why is it that voters are altruistic? Why do they care about minorities? Why are they not vehemently against minority rights when it comes to their own? Why is it that politicians can't mediate those interests better at their day? That's why we have representative democracy and not allow more rule. Thank you. That white voter in Arizona wouldn't have to care about gay people in New York and Los Angeles if the election system is rigged to disregard that particular minority, minority opinion at the end of the day. Let's recognize this, right? Yeah, legislative system also works in a competitive way, but you need majority to be able to influence the kind of laws and policies that are passed in that scenario. In that particular regard, if you will have to compare multiple different issues within a system of politics whereby you can just get away with one significantly more important issue if it affects you a lot more, we think it's unlikely for social change in their world to exist or even even be considered by people who necessarily are undecided at the end of the day. I have two arguments for you. First, why referendums are you compare it to paper in terms of providing access and making sure that these changes are sustainable, and secondly, how we necessary to create the awareness necessary for any kind of engagement and discussions to occur. But before that, a few rebuttals. Let's go on to the first point. So Rafik told us that it's difficult for undecided people to affect social change in a legislative level because more often than not, they are in undecided and they are often unable to materialize their indecisions at the end of the day. But in their world, what happens? One, the fact that more often politicians will only cater to a specific number of issues that are considerably more important and affects a lot more people in comparison to like gay rights that only affects a small group of people. For example, things like the economy, things like states' rights and politics, limited government okay. at the end of the day. In a comparative in our world, what would we do? What? The fact that more often than not, these social changes that happen in a referendum are often so, happening in a binary. With people, it means that you force people to answer between a yes or no. In a scenario where people are campaigning for a referendum, more often than not, people who are necessarily affected by that particular decision will necessarily campaign. They force people to be, sure. to be aware of the kind of decisions that they impact in comparison to sure. when you force people to weigh out multiple different issues in an election at the end of the day. The kind of exposure and campaigning that happens in reference, they are oftentimes existing in a binary, so we think that we are able to convince a lot more people in comparison with that they will have to weigh in multiple different issues at the end of the day, so we think, we think that comparative. But the second thing that they told us that the reason why referendums are obsolete in their world because they think that it is a tool for the government to dissolve away responsibilities when it comes to social change or anything like the politics within the EU. We told you that more often than not, these kind of decisions affect the greatest number of people when it comes to the social structures that exist anyway. So we don't think that it's up to them to necessarily decide because they are the ones that are necessarily the ones that will feel the brunt of the responsibility of the kind of decisions that the legislative make at the end of the day. So we think that we will obviously trade off some consistency when it comes to the checks that could not or might not exist in the state of governance in an election, but we think that in a comparative that we eliminate all kinds of participation that exist in the world. Why? Because more often than not, no thank you, politicians um, the people who vote for uh, politicians have an expectation of what they are voting for at the end of the day. More often than not, these expectations are the ones that could keep them accountable, but the fact that they can yeah, overweigh yeah. that different expectations that exist means that more often than not, they wouldn't necessarily have to care about what other person's consideration in an election at the end of the day. 
that consideration and expectations of you being able to push and be more persuasive for, for you to fight for your arguments for a gay marriage, for example, becomes stronger when a binary exists, ladies and gentlemen. Because the fact that is you push people to be able to recognize that yeah, yeah. expectation and we think it's considerably better when it comes to difficult decisions at the end. But the third thing we tell you, no thank you, is that the idea of referendums, the fact that it more often than not, it is more persuasive when it comes to legislating change because the fact that you are able to recognize the right. group of people who necessarily right. support one thing or the other, no thank you, at the end of day. In their world, the kind of external forces such as lobbying, you temp, you call, call lobbying with the corporations, your kind of interest, voting block on the ground, means that this external influence will be considerably stronger because why politicians have an incentive to stay in power too, the fact that politicians have and needed to be principally in line with the party that exists in a world of partisanship or side of government. No, thank you. We tell you that in a world whereby referendum becomes a tool of particularly to change things for the better for minorities, it becomes more persuasive in a world whereby you have to get that particular numbers in order for you to be able to pass this particular social change. Recognizing in order for that particular social change to even work, no, thank you, even to work to begin with, that number required, is required to exist. Yes, anyone? Okay, so in our worst case scenario, the legislature passed something that takes away minority rights, you have it on paper, or the court can challenge it based on the constitution to protect human rights. But if you have a referendum, courts, as well as the legislature, cannot overturn that. So how do you hold any of them accountable? Do you have to read people's minds? Opinions of the people have to be translated legislatively anyway. In a referendum, we are gorging your perception to what is it that you want within that social change of the end of the day. Using the Brexit, no thank you, using the Brexit example, right? If you have a legislation that forces the UK to leave the single market and you say that it's undemocratic and therefore the courts start it down, that can obviously happen in our world as well. Obviously the courts can determine whether or not your particular gauge of perception towards a social issue yeah. can be democratic at the end of the day, based in line for what is it that the country wants constitutionally and legally at the end of the day. So we think that that concern can be mitigated if we have a court system that can regulate that particular discussion yeah, yeah. Oh. Kind of random that exists. First argument, why discussion and discourse would be considerably better? No, thank you. In a world of opposition, we think that the binary that exists within the kind of discussions within that particular social issue forces people to necessarily care a lot more. Why? Two things. Why? The fact that people who are affected has a lot more incentive to necessarily reach out to a lot more people in order for that person and that issue to get more numbers. What is it that they told us of that particular sensationalization that exists on the side of government? They told us that all oh, media would necessarily, necessarily capitalize on the sensationalism of that controversial issue and grasp on the fears and uncertainty of people and that makes them influence their particular decision within that particular scenario. We told you, obviously people who care about the specific issues can counteract those particular narratives yeah, yeah. anyway, right? The difference is that it reflects a lot more people and the changes are necessarily big in magnitude. The kind of discussions that exist in our world whereby we force people to necessarily care about that particular binary means that the kind of exposure when it comes to people caring of you campaigning on you don't explain why gay marriage is good for society in general when you don't necessarily prosecute gay people or the fact that you would want the ability for people to necessarily go into the most safely at the end of the day. These are the kind of attitudes that will considerably exist better in our world because of the fact that they are not beholden to the partisanship that exists on yeah, the yeah. side of the house. You need to understand, when people are allowed to make decisions independently from the party lines that exist inside the school, it's considerably better for you to say that I am a Republican but I also support the right to abortion. I've never been so proud of people. Speech, now Notice that the absence of a referendum was never tantamount to the absence of democratic representation in totality. It was never tantamount to the absence of discourse or, uh, or access to policy decisions. Because if the opposition bench truly believes that it is, then ironically enough, it is their side who believes that the election system is broken, despite accusing the government team of losing faith within an electoral democracy. Three questions I'll answer in today's debate. Firstly, is a potentially bigoted direct democracy preferable to a progressive representative democracy? 
Secondly, our referenda is primarily used as a tool to forward social change or to defeat social change. And thirdly, our alternative vehicles of social change are far more sustainable in pushing forward for progressive change. Let's look at direct democracy preferable to progressive democracy, which is a direct comparative of two things that we wanted to champion. Two reasons that side opposition gave you that their model was preferable. One, people got to directly choose on single issues. And two, it increases access to policy decisions. Both of these things you believe are acute flaws that result in more higher likelihood of discrimination of these minorities. Yeah. When people get to directly choose on single issues instead of forming political compromises, why is that a good thing? Because political compromises fulfill is the better purpose of democracy because you get to achieve holistic representation of all communities instead of only focusing on issues that benefit you. That's called a tyranny of the majority, yeah, especially yeah, the majority yeah. who are directly not affected by minorities getting certain social rights. A functioning democracy is built on not numbers, it is built on the balance of rights. Who fulfills this balance of rights? Yeah, it's best yeah. exemplified by E, the legislative, where we actually build in bureaucratic guarantees to ensure representation, to ensure dynamic discourse, to ensure that the truth of information is honored versus the mistrust and fear that is bred by the media. Secondly, on the judiciary, which is always rights-centric and built on comparing the balance of rights of the communities that are being affected. We have no guarantee that when majorities get to decide on these single issues, that they will make the right, the right choice. And we don't even believe that the people are forced to make immense sacrifices on issues that are so important to their life because if that single issue was so important it would have been on the forefront of public policy discussion during the election campaign itself we don't think they would be asked to sacrifice those kinds of policy considerations yeah, yeah. secondly they wanted to say it increases access to policy decision because no one is prevented from making that decision we think this is a flaw because there is no barrier of access there's no barrier of access to voters who may be subjected to misinformation which is primarily what happens during the campaigning period there's no barrier to access to people who are vulnerable to the exploitation of fear through visceral media tactics. Who, where, where are these people more likely to reverse these kinds of opinions within the legislative and within the judiciary? It is far more difficult on your side of the house because you crystallize public opinion that could have far-reaching consequences to minorities. And here's where we want them to defend the burden because are they thinking? that all popular decisions are correct. Because yeah. I mistakenly believe that the purpose of this debate is to forward social change the best. But in their defense of direct democracy, we heard a concession from the speaker before us who told us, well, the people make the wrong decision. Let's just reverse it to other checks and balances. Well, then I'm confused. Are you defending direct democracy then? Because you don't believe in the virtues yeah, of direct yeah. democracy if you think the people's referendums can be checked and balanced. So either you believe that a bigoted democracy is far better as long as the majority gets to tyrannize over all social minorities or you believe that they shouldn't or you and they shouldn't reverse the strike brand or you agree with us where minorities should be protected and therefore the government wins on who ensures social change the best. Let's look at social change. Our referendum is primarily used as a tool to forward or defeat social change. Firstly, we told you when left as an option, there's a great political incentive for people, for politicians to delegate the duty to decide the public because progressive social issues are often polarizing, controversial social issues in which politicians amass massive amount of backlash against them if they're forced to decide. It is far easier for them to construct laws with the ability and say, oh, it's difficult. Why don't you guys decide? And this is far more, uh, far, far more, uh, problematic on this side because if the nature of politicians is that it's flexible. We can convince them and persuade them to see rationality and engage in discourse in a structural, rational way. But if people are forced to confront with their own mistakes, you think there's a lesser likelihood and a higher amount of ego to deviate from a more rational and dynamic discourse. And to uh, talk about the last argument that was put forward by um, Fred on discourse as well, we don't think any voter is prevented from discourse with their elected representatives. We don't think any voter is, has a barrier to access to policy decisions. In fact, we prefer that voters have a more structured and rational method of discourse under our side with elected representatives as opposed to anyone making decisions on any whim and those decisions to be temporary in nature. But secondly, we believe that this is not always in the context of the United States. When you look at contexts like, like Australia, for example, where the judiciary passed for merge equality and they use the referenda to, as a weapon to defeat social progress because it's so easy to implement fear in order to capitalize on the bigotry of the people, that's when referendums are primarily tools to defeat social change. Why? Because campaign processes are always bigotry centric. They're always right. bigotry leaning. A, we told you the media's profit incentive means that dramatization increases audience. But B, 
It empowers minority conservative groups to use their funding and political capital as a weapon to misrepresent popular opinion. And we don't even think this popular opinion is an accurate check of long-lasting social uh, uh, social opinions. Because if you show a visceral media of a baby being torn apart and picked apart, it's so easy to temporarily right. create a, a false public perception that is pro-life in nature without them self uh, without them questioning their own actual opinions on balancing the rights of individuals who are actually affected by this issue. Okay. Before I go on any further, yes. What's the likelihood of a minority wanting to engage in politics on the your side if they feel that the issue will always be at the back burner compared to a direct approximate vote to see that change? We think that's when political compromises by people who represent them are far more likely to be successful within the parliament or to access the judicial activism that they do under status quo to for social changes as opposed to completely binding decisions by the majority who may or may not be on your side. We believe when those things happen, you're the side that creates far-reaching consequences for these minorities. Last one, let's compare legislative and judiciary. Not only we told you that the legislative and judiciary are beholden to more objective standards, dynamic discourse, holistic representation. The question here is about easier checks and balances. We have far more accountability on our side of the house because they are legally beholden and have an obligation to explain and rationalize a human rights-centric decision to the people that they are governing. Secondly, they are far more easy to check for the abuse of those powers. You cannot hold society morally obligated to change their decisions because they say this is what we want. When you crystallize a bigoted public opinion, it is far harder for those minority groups to progress beyond that point because they have lost moral legitimacy because this is what the democracy wanted. Democracy didn't want to give you the rights that you wanted. Even if afterwards we allow checks and balances, when the judiciary reverses them, for the legislative reduces system, where is the moral legitimacy of that law? You just crystallized and bigoted public opinion and lost the ability to cooperate with the values of those laws because the people rejected them. You make it far harder for minorities to achieve social change. We're proud to propose. Thank you, thank you, speaker. Also, another welcome opposition way. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the problem inside government, right? Apparently, if we have referendum, we don't have any discussion whatsoever. Before we have the referendum, Friday you just come out in the air and nobody takes anything about it and interested parties will just keep quiet and not fact check. We don't think that's necessarily true and we think we have a lot of ways for us to keep the accountability. We don't see why it doesn't appear under our side. The second problem is that we talked to you about the singularity of issues, right? Which they never have wanted to engage with us. We talked to you about how in elections, there are a lot of things and there are a lot of underwhelming factors that causes social justice issues to always not be able to materialize. You can give gay marriage, you can give abortion, you can give a lot of things, but once somebody mentioned that I'm going to fight for jobs, all these things will always be put put aside because we wanted to fight for the politician who always serve the best interest of the majority and that's what they never engage with us. And thirdly, we talk, they wanted to have things like political compromise that apparently governments will always want to talk to you and that's the reason why everything's okay. But let's talk about this government, right? These are people who expected and who wanted to be re-elected in the next election. So we don't understand why only under their side, these people will always want to side with minority when these people doesn't have a lot of power, when they, when they should side with majority instead. We don't think these are the sort of government that will already initiate an action. We think it's highly problematic and that side. So first issue. Who are the what what is the best of, of action and who are the best actors? Because what government wanted is to have only the elite few to decide for the people. They wanted the legislative or the judiciary and they Maybe that like, sometimes listen to people when they have petitions, right? But the problem is that it answers to government, right? And all this actually requires something to happen. It requires a case. It requires something to trigger an action in judiciary or legislative. Yes, yes. Without the trigger, nothing will happen, and you will just have to wait until somebody lodge a case before an action can actually be taken. In referendum, when you think that you have critical mass, when you think that this is something fresh and something that people should consider, that's why you initiate the referendum, and that's why an action yes, can yes. be taken. So let's talk. Let's take a look about the. Person, right? On when we can take action, we told you that we can have better action and we can have it faster and we think because of that we'll yeah. take that issue. 
Okay, also, let's talk about the campaign, right? Because we talked to you about how there are a lot of interested parties, and definitely before a referendum, we're going to educate the public on what they are actually voting for. And why is this better? One, well, because we talked to you about the singular, singularity of issue, and prior to the referendum, it's a lot easier to educate the people on why maybe you should, you should consider minority rights when it's the only, it is the only issue that they have to consider and not at any other factor. Secondly, the reason why a lot of people get fair enough and they don't want to vote for minority rights is because they feel like if they vote in the election, they have to sacrifice their own interests yes, yes. because that is what happened. But in the referendum, they know that they don't have to sacrifice their own interests because it is only a singular issue on here. Whether or not you want the LGBT to have rights, uh, and that's about it. They don't have to sacrifice anything on their part and that's the reason why they are more than willing to compromise more because they feel like it is it, it doesn't really it doesn't um, really affect their interests and that's why they are more willing to be open. I mean we think that this will create people who are more open minded, people who are more willing to compromise because they don't see that it is gonna harm their interests. And next we talk to you about how we can have a lot of credibility, right? Maybe media will sensationalize that we consider the fact. But we can also have a lot of parties who we have a lot of NGOs who would also want to fact check and will correct any false information and and any false news. So we don't see why we don't have accountability yeah. under our side. Especially in a sensationalized news, definitely everyone will want to give their opinion on it and that's where we have more discussed. And why is this also important? Well, because the reason why referendum is highly impactful and very powerful is because people feel like they are actively contributing to it. Which means they feel like they have the power to change something and that's the reason why they rationalize a lot more when they are making decisions. But in voting or in legislative or judiciary, they feel like they can discharge their burden and not have to consider. Once I pick my politician, that's about it. I don't have any other power and that's the reason why yeah, all the yeah. effort stops that. In referendum, people make more effort to see that all these things are being executed because they are directly involved and that creates an attachment between them and the cause and that's how we get things done we don't see it done inside yeah. government so sit down so next issue what is better right well whether they because they wanted a lot of issues to be discussed together because apparently it's going to modulate the tone and we are going to have more meaningful discourses we don't think that's right. And why is that? Because we told you from the start about how politicians, they always use <coughs> their brain in order for them to dilute any other social justice issues, right? They don't want to defend minority. They don't want to have controversial issues. And that's really why they always hide it behind the veil of things like jobs or immigration yeah, and things yeah. like that. People are afraid to counter that. And that's the reason why they will always go with politicians who are more conservative in their ideas. And that's why we don't get changes. But in a singular issue, people are people find it easier to rationalize because people feel because it doesn't affect their interests and that's the reason why it's, it's easier for them to want to compromise. And Fred talked to you a lot about partisanship, right? About how people are beholden to their party. About how if I'm a republic, I cannot I cannot vote for abortion anymore. Because that's how that's your allegiance to your party. And that's the reason why a lot of people don't want to deviate from the uh, deviate from the cost of the party. Yeah. But now people can both be republic and also vote for abortion because you allow them that choices, because you allow them to pledge themselves to two separate causes because it doesn't harm their interests or it doesn't harm the other things that they are loyal to okay. before that yeah. might. Despite a conservative leaning public and parliament, Taiwan became the first Asian country to legalize homosexual marriage because the courts used equality provisions in the constitution to interpret it and allow gay marriage. Do you think the public would be just as altruistic as the court in Taiwan? All right, let's talk about courts, right? Because we told you about how they need to require a certain trigger before in the courts or the legislative would want to even take action, right? So the problem, the, so the problem here right now. One, that's an exception, but that's a very exceptional case, right? In which you wanted to do something that is that doesn't side with the majority. We are talking about government who have a lot of interest in wanting to be re-elected. We don't see why they will want to side with the majority when it will cause them an election and will cause them a governance later on. We don't see why. So next so last so last thing, right? So Especially when we are talking about the context of liberal democracy, right? Sure, everyone can connect with their politicians, everyone can connect between borders. But the problem here is that at which at, at which level of priority is the 
is the issue of social justice is. And we tell you it's always going to be low. We have never, it's very, it's so rare to see a politician wanting to fight for social justice when there is a lot of other problems there, like national security, like not having jobs at all. So that's the reason why in a representative, representative democracy, sure you have all the problems out there, but the problem is that nobody really wanted to engage or invest their cost in it because they feel that like it is a lost cause and it's easier to just discharge it. Only in the referendum, you have, you can fight for it and it, it doesn't cost you and that's the reason why you feel like it is, you can invest on it and because of that, that's the reason why we believe that they are, they are better and more meaningful discourses and investment on the cost. Because of that, there is a good thing. Okay, we take a speak for their speech, now the opposition replies speech. When minorities are apathetic with their ability to change something legislatively because they see that politicians will never care about them because they are numerically disadvantaged, when people think that elections are just a way for you to, to, for you to project the whims of the majority, not recognizing that there are, might be people who are beholden to their own interests and might necessarily are willing to care about the other side if they are just extending their own hand and giving it away from their own interests at the end of the day. Three things on why we will win this thing. One, we will create a world whereby people are more likely going to participate in that particular decision. Why? Two things. One, the fact that we told from Mukherjee's speech that the idea of people being apathetic is because people recognize that in a structural system like the government, it is unlikely for people to want to care because one, they are not caring about their interests because there are multiple different issues that people need to care about. But secondly, number two, the kind of politicians that will necessarily cater to this particular scenario are often the minority because they are only catering to a vote that are numerically disadvantaged in comparison to people who care about more tangible things such as jobs and states' rights or even marijuana rights at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. The kind of sacrifices that politicians make all the time in that particular world are often sacrifices that only excludes the minority in this scenario because the fact that they are disadvantaged and they are con unconsidered, unimportant politically. What happens in our world? What? We told you that it's easier for people who are on the fence to rationalize helping minorities because of the fact that we create a scenario where all their decisions in that referendum are independent from all other interests such as yes, jobs, yes. politics, or your privilege at the end of the day. It creates a scenario whereby people are more likely going to be engaging because of the fact that it's a binary. It's a yes or a no. This decision doesn't affect you. Do you want to do something about it at the end of the day? It's easier for them to rationalize that decision in comparison to a world of government whereby you have a legislative process that is structurally incapable of changing things because it doesn't require any minority participation whatsoever, right but also a judiciary that is also contingent upon you proving why you have some legitimacy within a constitution that might not be necessarily favorable to that minority at the end of the day. You need to tell yeah, me why yeah. that is likely to so, happen. But the second thing we told you is that the idea of the kind of engagement that exists within this scenario means that all of the partisanship will never be able to be a which be influencing these people's minds at the end of the day. Notice that the kind of things that they went, they wanting, they wanted to talk about when it comes to the sensationalization and the influence of fear and uncertainty can be applied in their world as well. But the difference in their world is the fact that that particular fear and uncertainty tap into the same amount of partisanship that exists in that scenario. Why? Because you will have politicians that would want to fight for your interest. You will have politicians that will cap on that fear and uncertainty and say, if you vote for me, it is likely for me to be able to translate all this fear and uncertainty to something that's tangible for you at the end of the day. Because the fact that there are multiple different issues that are tied to that fear and uncertainty. In comparison to our world, whereby maybe that fear and uncertainty will not necessarily resonate with the kind of social changes that necessarily exist in the particular referendum. You cannot use fear and uncertainty to tap into social changes as much as you can tie it down to that particular scenario in which your legislation is something that's conservative. And yet, it's unlikely for fear to work when it comes to things like gay marriage, things like abortion, because the fact that it's unlikely for people to fear about giving rights to a lot more people in comparison to what happens in Yarmouk. The fact that remains, ladies and gentlemen, 
the world in which the side of opposition operates. It's a world that is favorable towards people who are more willing to engage when it comes to the undecided voters, when it comes to social change, and also the people that are more likely going to yeah, yeah. put away their interests when it comes to caring about minorities. It's time for the new to take over the old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy an equity complete. Yes, I'm going to speak. Let's speak now to close the debate for the old. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the opposition case was but a child's tantrum about not being able to get what they want, just like not being able to go to the finals. Oh. But the first thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that, oh, too harsh? Never mind, it's okay. Um, the first thing is, if you notice, ladies and gentlemen, the entirety of the opposition case relied on proving whether or not there was a greater likelihood of progressive referendums getting passed versus regressive ones in this particular yeah. circumstance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in this regard, they provided very little analysis to the effect. The first thing they provided was that they told us, and this came out in opposition with, that apparently people who had no interest in that, in that situation would be okay enough to vote yes towards progression. When we gave you right from Prime Minister, the individuals are incentivized by not only the fear of the unknown, the religious sentiments, I'm sure religious individual for Arizona will not like a, a, a homosexual, irrespective if you bring up economic arguments or not bring up economic arguments. And certainly, ladies and gentlemen, all the sensationalization we talked to you about from the media were all reasons to believe that an individual will feel, feel affected even if the, parli the parliament or the vote doesn't present it as being affected by one another, ladies and gentlemen. In that particular circumstance, if that person feels like homosexuals shouldn't get married, trans people shouldn't be able to go to bar <coughs> it doesn't matter if that person doesn't feel affected, that person feels morally obliged to vote no in this particular circumstance. What's your answer then? Will that person still vote progressively? I'm not sure because it came out weird. Yeah. The second thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that you can't hold those uh, opinions accountable, therefore not being able to change those opinions. I we told you right from the start and later on in my speech that you can't change people's opinions when it comes to a referendum. That people get defensive about those opinions. People get upset and angry whenever you ask them to change their decisions as opposed to a politician who has to mediate between interests because both equally as our voters in this particular circumstance. At the very least, on the outside, you need the seats of someone that comes from a predominantly black community because you need to get a legislation passed. On that side, you can rely on harsh numbers and actually accentuate the numerical disadvantage that minorities have on your side of the house. At the very least, we have seats as leverage. What do you have? You actually have to rely on the numeric numerics on your side of the house. How are you going to win? We didn't know, right? But the third thing is that we also told you many people wouldn't feel the consequences, wouldn't need to think about it, and at best case scenario, would be unthinking and defaulted into conservative decisions under our side of us. So really, when you looked at all the analysis that was actually presented earlier than opposition with, then you would have to realize that people don't make really good representative democratic decisions when you put it up for referendum. So on the most important question, whether it was likely for you to get progressivism, they failed that burden. But the converse that we provide you was so many structural things that they never responded to. That the fact that we told you that you could negotiate immediate interest, that politicians that fear they say politicians fear the majority, but that's the same majority that they will rely on in order to yes. have their referendums anyway. But at least we provide you analysis in graphic speech to tell you why within the four-year tenure that you have as an elected representative, in internally within those four years, public sentiment is mercurial. That means you won't have to sustain the kind of like bleak picture of refugees flooding into your country for the rest of your four years. You can mediate and barter your negotiated interests, ladies and gentlemen. You can hold them accountable. You can make them change their decisions. You can hold them accountable to the, for example, reasoning in this circumstance. You don't need to wait for the legislation to have a case involved in order to have a legislation that's only for the courts of Kila. That's again a late matter. In that particular circumstance, surely in this debate, the last thing is that if this issue was so important that it was forced to have a referendum about, it was such an important political issue like Brexit, 
surely the very same issue wouldn't have been pushed to the back end of the legislative agenda in this particular circumstance. Such a convenient characterization by the opposition, ladies and gentlemen. At the end of this debate, we need a system in which, in which we can have things that minorities have to barter to allow for numerical disadvantages to be overcome that only occurs with representative democracy. Okay, thank you all for your speeches. Audience, please show your appreciation for the two teams.